Order members, <clears throat> the sitting is resumed. It's time for questions to Mr. Peter Weir, the Minister for Education, and I call Mr. Andrew Muir. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number one. I thank the member for his question. Through Fresh Start funding, my department is delivering a hugely significant capital investment of almost £10 million in Bangor Central Integrated Primary School. The business case was approved by the department in July 2020 and identified the preferred option of a new build school on a new site on the Blue Road in Bangor. The project will provide a, a brand new single storey school with modern facilities fully compliant with the department's school building handbook. The school will be built upon a new site 1.7 miles away from the existing school in an easy accessible part of the town uh, with sufficient room for future expansion. The construction work will uh, be able to take place without causing any disruption to the ongoing operation of the school. Um, in July 2020, the Education Authority appointed an integrated uh, con uh, consultant team to undertake the design, and this work is now in the early stages of the design process. When completed, the new facilities will enhance the provision of integrated education in the North Down area and support the future growth of the sector. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. As the Minister has outlined, the, this will be a new site out in the Blue Road. What assurances can the Minister give that the children and young people living in Bangor Town Centre will be catered for as a result of this move to the new site? Well, any provision will be made in terms of, um, as with transport of anybody, for example, if, they're, if the member is talking about uh, transport uh, in relation to it, where uh, there is a entitlement in terms of movement uh, for free school transport to be provided if, uh, if children are outside the distance. But it should be indicated, I suppose, that in terms of the Bangor Central Integrated Primary, because it's the one integrated school at primary level within uh, Bangor specifically, uh, it does actually draw a fairly wide catchment area. So at present, for instance, of the, the two main wards in the centre of Bangor, uh, as the member will know, because it he had put in a written question in relation to this, would represent about a third of the pupils who go to Bangor Central, the other two thirds coming from outside uh, that area. So to some extent it will shift perhaps the emphasis or the location, but I think as with uh, all occasions, children will be catered for in terms of um, any level of, of movement. Ms Rachel Woods. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. The Minister will know that I have many questions on this, but for now, can the Minister outline what consultation was done with the school, the Board of Governors and the parents about this move, as well as the wider community? And will he commit to meeting with me and a group of parents and interested parties regarding the proposed school move? I, I am always happy to meet with the, uh, with the member. I have met, indeed, with uh, some interested parties in relation to it. It was part of a project. There is a project board for each of the fresh start uh, that's, which involves the school directly themselves, um, which there was consultation and discussion. Look, we should remember if the issue is around uh, the location, uh, I would point out a, uh, on at least three separate issues in relation to this. First of all, the statutory duty in the department is to integrate education. It's not to a specific site or specific location. And so therefore, when looking at this, it's, it's what is in the, the best interest of the sector as a whole. Secondly, on a business case point of view, um, this enabled this was something which, from a public cost point of view, has a considerable difference from simply building on site in terms of the, uh, the current location. And the member should also be aware that, in terms of fresh start capital, it is something that specific projects will require treasury sign-off. So it's not simply a matter of what is. Uh, what the department feels, and indeed providing a situation which best value for money. But it is also, if we're looking at the broader position in terms of um, integrated education in the broader level on it, this is a school which actually, in terms of its location, there is actually more room at this site. So that if there was, for instance, an additional unit to be put onto the school, there's an opportunity for that to happen at a future point, whereas the central site, and it is one that I'm very familiar with, uh, would have much more limited um, space in terms of accommodation. So all those factors. But you know, I'd be happy to um, meet the member on those. But the member should be aware that in terms of location, the decision has been taken. Mr. Alan Chambers. Uh, Mr. Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, uh, I certainly welcome this investment uh, in my constituency, uh, and I understand that the Board of Governors and the, the, the staff of the school fully support this move. 
but there does seem to be a body uh, of resistance uh, um, building against the move. Um, has your department had any sense of, of this, this movement against the move? Well, look, in terms of location, there, there, there will be, and it's very natural that, that people are seeing particularly history tied up with a particular site uh, for it to move to a different location. Um, but as indicated, it is not, you know, if we were to provide neighbourhood specific schools for every school, that, that would not be an appropriate way of, of dealing with it. So, look, I think it's perfectly natural, and I suspect that most people, if they are linked in with a particular school, will have a particular emphasis on that, on that location. As the member mentioned himself, in terms of the project board, in terms of the, the governors, I think they have accepted this. And there is also, as, as I indicated, a wider commitment that has got to be there in terms of a business case of what is provided uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to the sort of the uh, to the, the treasury in relation to it. I think it's also the case that uh, because of the pressure on places across the board, even at primary sector within Bangor, it is not a question of a level of displacement will create problems, largely speaking, elsewhere because there are, there isn't really much of any in the way of spare capacity within the the system. Question number two, in the name of Mr. Andy Allen, has been withdrawn. Mr. Stuart Dixon. Uh, development proposals proposing transformation to controlled integrated status for two uh, Mid and East Antrim schools were published on the 26th of March. They were DP 6465, Carrick Fergus Central Primary, um, where the proposal was to transform to a controlled integrated status with effect from the 1st of September 2021 or as soon as possible thereafter, and DP 648, which is Seaview Primary School, uh, to transform to controlled integrated sta status with effect from, again, from the 1st of September 2021 or soon after. Area planning activity was paused uh, due to COVID on the 3rd of April 2020, with the exception of special education provision in mainstream and special school settings so that all available resources, including uh, staff, could be redeployed in support of the department's emergency response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. As a consequence, the progression of DPs has been delayed. However, uh, we're now in a position that there can be a restart to this, and an extraordinary meeting of the area planning steering group was held on the 21st of October, and the decision taken formally to resume all area planning operations and structures from that date. The Department has extended the statutory objection period um, for, and I should say by way of objection, it can be both letters of support and uh, opposition, for affected DPs to provide a full two-month consultation outside of the suspension period. The revised closing dates for these transformation proposals was the 9th of November 2020. Work on the assessment of these proposals has recommenced and decisions on these, DP, these, T, these DPs will be made as soon as possible. Mr. Dixon. Thank you. And can I thank the Minister uh, for his answer uh, and very much appreciate the difficulties that his department has had uh, during that time, but very welcome that they are now back on track to make these decisions. Particularly welcome the one with regards to Central. Uh, but, Minister, in respect of Seaview, you will appreciate that it is less than three miles away from an already successful integrated primary school, which is celebrating 20 years uh, this year. H how does the Minister see the development plan proposal, uh, bearing in mind that these are two villages less than three miles apart? Well, the member uh, will forgive me, and I don't know how much you were directly a process. But in terms of development proposals, while they are, will be initiated by different um, bodies and indeed brought forward, ultimately it will come, uh, come down to a legal decision which has got to be made by the department and whether it's administered by the minister directly. Therefore, I'm duty bound ahead of any decision on a development proposal to make no comment at all on the merits of that, of that case, either for or against um, that, uh, that proposal. And so, while I think all factors will be borne in mind in terms of the situation as regards Seaview uh, and Carrick, uh, I will have to judge all those factors when it comes to it. I can't comment on, for instance, the, the distance between existing schools at present, but obviously all factors will be taken into account before there is a decision. Mr Jim Allister. Um, can the Minister advise the House, in making decisions about these matters, how far are the wider community ramifications considered, in that if you take Seaview, for example, the impact upon a school like Kernalbin, a primary school that the Minister kindly visited, uh, could be quite serious, in that a school that, that is struggling to 
re regenerate itself and get back going, could have the rug pulled from under itself by a further a, a advancement of an alternative offering nearby? It, it is the case that we look at the impact on surrounding schools, I suppose very specifically uh, it's not simply about the sustainability of the schools, but the key focus will, is actually on the direct education of the, the young people. So, for example, if a school was either transforming or it was, uh, there was a merger or a closure, it is what implications will be there, particularly for those children locally. It, it will be looked at uh, any, uh, any school will look at what the, the wider implications for the nearby schools, and indeed as part of the process, uh, there is a effectively a grid, if you like, of, of nearby schools that, that this is highlighted within that. With the distance from the school, uh, it is broken down by sectors, it is broken down by uh, the number of children that is there. So all factors are taken into account, but obviously overriding considerations are very specifically the, the broader educational um, implications for uh, those children, and what is sustainable as well. And I appreciate it is rare unless it is maybe a minor, um, a more minor indication in terms of school numbers that any development proposal is entirely uncontroversial um, in its nature because it clearly, even decision with any school, will have a, a ripple effect, if you like, uh, across the board. Questions four in the name of Mr. McGuigan, seven in the name of Mr. Chambers, and eight in the name of Mrs. Cameron have been grouped. Mr. Philip McGuigan. Kesh ever a car. Question four. Thank the member for, uh, indeed all three members for their, their questions, so I'm, I'm going, as I said, as the Principal Deputy Speaker to answer all three together. It's my priority that examinations to award CCEA qualifications should go ahead as planned in 2021. I've already announced a number of adaptations to CCEA qualifications, including the emissions of assessments for whole units for most GCSEs and health-related adaptations for AS and A levels. However, I've also stated that I would keep the situation under review and my officials have been working with CCA to develop a range of further mitigations and contingencies to respond to the fluid uh, public health situation. That work is in an advanced stage, and I hope to provide um, more information very soon. In these uncertain times, I think the familiarity with the exam system provides greater certainty as learners know what they are working towards and how it is awarded. And additionally, I suppose, when looking at the wider implications in terms of examinations, We've also got to be careful that, that, uh, that our students in Northern Ireland are not disadvantaged between each other, as uh, it will not simply be a question of what is done within CCAA, but a number of students, particularly at A level, will also carry out um, examinations from different boards outside of Northern Ireland, but also when it comes to their qualifications, that they are seen as both robust and also portable and comparable compared to their counterparts in neighbouring jurisdictions. Mr. McGuigan. Gurram Elgood, uh, pretty last can call you. And the Minister, in his response, talked about disadvantage, and there's no doubt that the educa educational experience uh, during the pandemic to date has varied greatly and will continue to vary, uh, no doubt, as long as COVID is with us. Uh, and there is no level playing field, uh, Minister, and in my view, the CCA proposals don't go far enough. Given the level of disruption to classes, the level of COVID absences and the amount of lost learning time, uh, will uh, the Minister give further consideration to how the exam series in 2021 will be addressed? Well, indicated that exams will go ahead, and I think it's important. Sometimes uh, there has been a little bit of a, maybe sometimes genuine, sometimes false discussion around when will you give certainty. Clearly, the certainty is that exams will take place, and I think it's important that, and I think one of the byproducts where sometimes there has been, um, and I think there's a genuine concern that has been raised, uh, is that some schools, concerned that exams will not take place, are over-testing their pupils on a daily basis. I think that is something that's entirely negative, and schools should be operating largely as they do, as normal as, as possible, and not placing levels of undue strain. Indeed, one of the concerns uh, that in terms of uh, maintenance of exams is that we don't reach a situation that if exams were abandoned, that pupils will be put under effectively a seven-month microscope where every assignment, every action that they take uh, would be a highly pressurised um, situation. But the member is right in terms of, that's why we're looking at a range of adaptations, where we can have tasked CCA to look at the issue of optionality, which will give greater choice to students when they're taking it. It is also, I think, as well as adaptations, what contingencies will be put in place. And again, this is not something well, it may be a particular focus this year, is not unique to this year, because there will be a number of occasions 
uh, in a normal year where uh, pupils, for instance, are not able to sit a particular paper, they are perhaps ill, they are disrupted in some shape or form. So those contingencies will need to be uh, thought through as to what provision is put in place there. There will be a series of other adaptations that will be put in place, and I hope to bring that, uh, that further level of clarity um, as we move on very shortly. Mr. Alan Chambers. Well, Deputy Speaker, thank you, Minister, for your answer. I think you have sort of uh, answered the question I was going to ask, but for the record, can the Minister commit to not changing this position so that students and parents can at least have clarity over what they need to prepare for with regards to upcoming exams? Look, it is entirely, uh, it is entirely my position to ensure that, that exams take place. Now, nobody can be absolutely a crystal ball saying what, what we're position we could be in a number of months' time, albeit I think that a lot of the while there is, I think, as even the Prime Minister indicated, there are, if you like, still some difficult days to get ahead, that the overall picture is, is improving. I think that exams represent the fairest way and a route in which um, that, uh, uh, that effectively people can be judged entirely on their own, their own merits. But there has got to be levels of adaptation to this year's examinations because of the levels of disruptions that the pupils have had and not necessarily on, an, on a level playing field uh, on that basis. So, the reality is that there is no solution within this which is going to be uh, perfect, but it is noticeable that all jurisdictions, by one means or another, is effectively doing exams, even if at least one of them isn't saying it's doing exams, it's doing it by a, a different, a different um, nomenclature. Mrs Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I uh, also thank the Minister for his answers um, so far. Um, can the Minister outline what steps his department is or could take to further alleviate pressure on pupils facing important assessments under these very challenging of circumstances? Well, I think the first thing is to try to give them certainty. I think there's a message that when we see the adaptations, I think there is a clear message that we want to send out to schools because I know a number of people have raised the concern less about the direct examination themselves, but the level of pressure that children are being put under on a daily basis. And some of this is coming from schools who are taking a view that if they have to produce some level of, of evidence, for instance, as to what level of assessment they produce, they will be worried about um, parents suing them, etc. This has then, I think, led to an, an undue level of pressure that's being placed on a daily basis on, on children. So I think that is the case. It is also the case that there have been a range of mitigations that some driven by health, some driven by reducing the level of assessment, that in a number of occasions we've been able to enable a unit within uh, particularly the GCSEs to be removed so that there can be up to 40% of that GCSE not assessed. So if you like, effectively the, the pupil will then be uh, assessed on 60% rather than, rather than the 100%, which eases the burden considerably. Uh, it is also the case, I think, to be fair, that while there has been levels of disruption, Schools are becoming additionally adept in terms of the remote learning that they are producing. So it is not a question if somebody is off that, that there is no work being uh, produced, albeit that face-to-face -face teaching is, uh, is very much uh, to, the, to the fore. But it is, also, it is also the case that in terms of adaptations, that there will be further adaptations need to be looked at. I think particularly that will focus in on A-level and AS-level, uh, and I looked for, I look forward to holding that conversation very shortly with CCAI, who are currently drafting up proposals uh, for that. Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I am aware of one school in Northern Ireland which has pupils on their fourth period of self isolation, an entire year group that has missed four weeks of school based learning this term. And of course, there are pupils physically unable to sit GCSEs taking place this week due to COVID related absence. So, can I ask the Minister? Why are contingency plans not already in place to address anxiety caused by these absences and to ensure all pupils receive fair grades? Well, look, from that point of view, we want to make sure there has already been certain levels of contingency put in place. And indeed, in terms of opportunities, CCEA have made clear that, for instance, those who are sitting this uh, week's examinations, if there is a reason why they can't do it, there will be opportunity, further opportunities, for instance, in March of this year, potentially in July. Uh, of this year, it is about trying to get things uh, correct. I want to see one of, I want to see two things happening. First of all, I think CCA have got to come forward with their draft uh, proposals. We need to actually produce then a holistic picture. It is also the case that uh, the independently Deloitte have been tasked to look at what happened in 2020. They are due to report fairly soon uh, as well. So it is important that all those lessons are put into place 
to ensure that we have something that is fair as possible. I think it's about trying to equalize out as much as possible. There is no doubt in current circumstances there is no perfect solution and there's no entirely fair solution. But I think that, uh, particularly as we look towards the robustness of our exams, trying to ensure that, that our pupils do get something which is fair uh, and equally portable, that we do have something which, which links in with what is happening um, elsewhere, and that exams themselves, with the levels of mitigations, adaptations and contingencies, represent the fairest way, way forward. If, for instance, we were to abandon exams, for instance, in 2021, there would also be the consequence that when we get to 2022, A-level students who are probably doing ultimately the most important exam that they were doing in their lives would have gone to a situation where they would have never sat a public examination before doing those, those A-levels. And that, I think, would be something that would massively disadvantage them when it comes, for instance, either employment or university places. Mr. Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister for the answers to the questions so far. I think, Minister, most are in agreed, students, uh, teachers, parents, that the fairest option facing you and facing our young people is to cancel GCSE examinations this year. Minister, in view of the importance and significance of the, uh, 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 as you have clearly said, the portability of qualifications, and in light of Scotland and Wales unilaterally deciding to change their qualifications, is the Minister now mindful not to recognise the Scottish and Welsh qualifications in that regard? entirely recognise what's happened in Scotland and Wales. Scotland, in terms of their hires, which are, their hires which are used effectively for entry into university, are keeping with examinations, as indeed is the next layer below. Scotland have made an adjustment which affects about 10 per cent of its pupils, but they have made sure that their pupils are not disadvantaged when it comes to employment and indeed into entry. Wales have produced what I would call the, the David Copperfield solution. They have presented a few mirrors and made it look like exams have, have disappeared. But as part of their proposals, which have not been particularly well sketched out, it talks about one of the key bits of their assessment will be external assessments, externally set, externally marked. And presumably if an assessment is being done externally, the only way to be fair between, there's only one or two solutions to that, either you allow schools to do that completely willy-nilly, in which case you're not creating any level of playing field between that, or effectively uh, those pupils are doing it in exam conditions. So wheels appear to suggest that they're not doing exams, but they are doing exams. And that is not just my opinion, but for example, the National Association of Head Teachers in Wales have said, Wales is doing exams under a different title. This is, you know, exams under a different name. And so let us get to the kernel of the truth of this. All, all jurisdictions, including Wales, Scotland, England, and the Republic of Ireland, are all doing, for their main set of, of students, examinations in 2021. Northern Ireland is a small jurisdiction. We cannot afford simply to go on a level of solo run. And indeed, particularly given that, that close to 20% of our students at A-level do English board examinations, we cannot create a situation where we create that level of differential between some of our students in Northern Ireland and some others within Northern Ireland. That, that would be simply folly. Ms Rachel Woods. Good, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. The Minister will be aware that one of the key issues arising as a result of COVID-19 in general is effective and meaningful communication to ensure education can continue in the safest manner for, for our teachers and pupils. So can I ask the Minister to detail what formal consultation he has had with teachers and trade unions since school reopened in September regarding exams, but also school reopening in general? Well, look, we've met with a range of stakeholder groups. Um, I'm in terms of that, there is ongoing discussions that will take place with the trade unions and ongoing, on a regular basis, discussions that take place within that. We also have a stakeholder group of, um, uh, of school principals, and indeed, particularly in terms of engagement with our officials, um, with those principals, that has taken place particularly on the examination on a, on a couple of occasions uh, within that. And indeed, when the issues have been discussed through, particularly among school principals, they've agreed that the best way forward actually is examinations as well. There isn't a level of demurring from that because it is very difficult. There's no certainly perfect way that if centre assessed grades were to be used as to how we could moderate those so that it's got to be one pupil in one school is on as much as possible, given a lot of the constraints that are there, a level playing field um, with others. And it is clear that examinations represent, however imperfect, the best opportunity for a level playing field between students because Students are not only competing to get their own grades, but they're competing against others, particularly when it comes to university places, when it comes to later employment, and indeed so that their grades can also be, have a level of comparability, not just with their peers, but also whenever they're competing against others 
of, a different, of different years that, that you can have a level of read across uh, within that. Given the issue, I thought it was important that a, a single member from each party got asking a question of the Minister. I know there was another member, but I'll, I'll make it up to you next time, Robbie. Um, Mr. Paul Frew. Five, Mr. I uh, thank the member for his, uh, his question. During the period uh, when face-to-face -face assessment was suspended, the Education Authority's Educational Psychology Service continued to progress stage three, four and five assessments, which had previously been consulted on and agreed with schools, and worked closely uh, with EA colleagues in statutory operations to provide psychological uh, advice when requested. The service was able to gather information from questionnaires and other screening tools administered via telephone or video call. Um, telephone consultations with school sources, such as the school's Senko, um, previous uh, assessments, scores from standardised tests or other attainment information, and analysis of the child's de uh, developmental checklist, with the view that this information may be added at a later stage where necessary. In addition, the service uh, uh, provides advice and resources to staff as well as training to support children and young people who are struggling at, at this time. The service continued to provide support during the period of school reopening and face-to-face -face assessments resumed in September 2020. Mr Frey. Thank you, Mr uh, Principal Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer to my question. Can I ask then, uh, how will the Minister and how will the Department manage the backlog, which I'm sure is mounting, uh, and how will this be rectified before school placement time, given the fact that some of these children may well have to attend special needs schools? The position, when the member says that uh, it is mounting, it did mount, I suppose maybe is, is more accurate uh, in terms of the, the tense of that. So yes, there's, there's no doubt that because of some of the pressures that were there with COVID, it meant that the extent of involvement was there, as I indicated, there was able to be certain things carried on, but was, was limited. So work, I think, continues to manage backlog cases with the aim of reducing those. Um, the particular focus, I think, are those children who've been waiting longest. Uh, and that can include a range of actions to reconfigure processes uh, and workflows across offices. Uh, it'll be achieved through a combination of EA's continuing process improvement work and a level of uh, additional short-term uh, staff resource. Uh, a capacity and demand analysis is being finalised to define the short-term resource that will be required and where short-term resource will be indicated, in, I think, as part of this year. In fact, just um, a matter of a couple of days ago, there has been some additional money has been granted uh, through uh, the monitoring round. But the short-term resource, but also I think there's also a longer-term delivery model to try to uh, ensure the sustained performance within the 26-week um, uh, week period. As indicated, um, you know, delays have been too long, but we are starting to see a level of improvement. And so, for example, um, if you go back a year ago today, um, there were 107 children waiting basically a year and a half uh, for the statementing process. In terms of that level of, of delay, by the end of September of this year, uh, there was no child that was waiting a year and a half. Uh, and indeed, uh, compared with 158 children who were waiting um, a little bit over a year. Uh, a year ago, that number is down to, uh, on a 60-week period, is down now to 10. Uh, and again, there's an 83% improvement in children waiting over 40 weeks. So, you know, there has been action taken. There's no doubt that COVID created problems in that, but I think there are new processes in place which will help uh, reduce that further. Ms. Emma Rogan. Can I ask the Minister um, if there has been an assessment of the impact um, that reducing statutory obligations in respect of special education needs to what are best described as best endeavours um, and what has the effect of this had on the children? Well, the, the indications are that, that what we tried to provide actually is an improving service within that. There's, look, there's no doubt that in terms of, um, and I think it was something that there wasn't really any alternative that in terms of what could precisely be provided during COVID, was that going to be necessarily absolutely the same as it was under normal times? No, and I think that is the case across a wide range of, uh, of services. So our aim, I suppose, is the focus to try to make sure that the backlog is cleared, that we uh, reduce waiting times, and that indeed both from a short-term intervention, and we've seen that there has been improvements in terms of, in terms of waiting times, um, and also a longer-term plan is put in place. But there's no doubt 
that for any child, the longer they have to wait, uh, the less service that can be provided for them, the more difficult it is for that, that child. And that's what we're trying to, to combat. But we've also got to work, and particularly during that peak period of COVID, against practical realities as well. That ends the period for listed questions. We'll now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. Uh, before I call uh, Mr Allister, I announce to the House that question number 10, standing in the name of Ms Paula Bradley, has been withdrawn. Mr Allister. Thank you. The Minister will be aware that the last week of Christmas term in primary schools is a particularly exciting and significant week. Did one can well imagine the Minister, no doubt, excelling in the role of be, playing a wise man, maybe. But uh, <laughs> in terms of this upcoming week, obviously it's going to be very different, but schools are still preparing. Kids are full of anticipation about in-bubble, in-class uh, celebrations. Can the Minister therefore assure the House that he will not uh, countenance the closure of our primary schools a week early, as some have been suggesting, and thereby bring devastation to many kids looking forward to those festivities? No, I, very nice, albeit I think the member was probably slightly tongue in cheek when he referred to me as a wise man. I, I, I'm just glad he hasn't referred to me as Herod uh, within the, uh, the situation. Can I say both as regards, uh, as regards primary schools and regards post-primary schools? I, I am aware at times there have been rumours floating about, I suppose this is Northern Ireland, there is no substance to those rumours. Schools will continue on, on their normal uh, Christmas period up until uh, the week before Christmas on that basis. There are no plans uh, to close. None of that has come from myself, Department of Education, the EA, but it is a little bit of, of um, whispering around the place. And I think that is important that, that schools remain open. It has been also the case that whenever um, the restrictions were talked about by the executive, the, the executive unanimously agreed across all the parties that schools should remain open. And that is both from an educational point of view, it is from a social point of view. And, and the member is right that particularly, albeit there will be certain constrained uh, situations this year, so at various events around nativities, around a um, situation where I'm aware a number of schools have booked a video photographer and, and such like to take, it's important that those, those go ahead. That, you know, there were a number of things that were missed out, I think, towards, by necessity towards the end of the last academic year, those school leaver type situations. I'm keen not to add to that. I think it is also the case, I have to say, that from a pure health point of view, to inject um, an extra week's holiday before Christmas and effectively say, here is a large number of, of, of children with the best will in the world, simply just to be at home, probably creating levels of socialization, is actually probably would be detrimental from a health point of view as well. So I'm totally opposed and there are no plans to close schools early. Mr Allister. I'm grateful for the clarification from the Minister. Can he bring the same certainty in respect of the holding of the transfer tests in January? Yes, I mean, as far as I can, uh, certainly from that point of view, uh, as the members are aware, AQE and PPTC who hold the transfer um, tests are independent organisations. So ultimately, it lies within their hands and the hands of the, um, the schools that, that hosted. But certainly, I think there's been levels of engagement where, um, for example, all the health and safety measures will be put in place. Uh, they're perfectly prepared for them, as far as we're So uh, there is no intention for those to be uh, cancelled either. Uh, and I think it is important. The member does make a very valid point that the more certainty that we can give people, I think uh, the better within that, even if sometimes the certainty we give may not be the, the exact certainty that some others would, would want in relation to some of those issues. Uh, Mrs. Dolores Kelly isn't in her place. Ms. Cara Hunter isn't in her place. Mr. John O'Dowd. I'm on the good list. So, um, in terms, <laughs> uh, Minister, you'll be aware of, of recent stories around the concerns of pupils who are bubbling in their classrooms and in their schools, but then get onto buses where there's multiple schools on those buses. I understand uh, they have been corrected when they've been raised, and indeed I raised one earlier in the year myself. Has there been a scoping exercise carried out to see where this is happening and what measures can be taken to ensure it doesn't happen? Yes, what we have done in, in relation to it, and the member will be aware, obviously as part of that we've moved to a situation which hopefully should reduce levels of transmission in terms of moving in terms of post-primary uh, children then, that there's a requirement of both public transport and school transport. 
uh, for them to wear masks. Uh, we are up against, I suppose, levels of practical restrictions, which in terms of, of um, free transport reached about 80,000 pupils each day. Um, but I've certainly instructed officials to work with TransLink, with EA and the Department of Infrastructure to see, for example, while there's been some additional money has been able to be levered in in terms of additional transport, obviously there are levels of restrictions, but to try to make sure that um, we use that transport as wisely as possible. So if there is some additional pressures on some routes, whether buses can be brought in, uh, you know, if there is there some level of rejigging, I think that that would be something that we'd be happy to uh, embrace as well. But I think the member also raises, I think, a very important point, which I think in terms of the threat that is out there, is that there has been a lot of good work done directly within schools, and indeed schools themselves, particularly within bubbles, within that, I think do not represent a particularly particular risk to people. So the, the danger is, if you like, from wider community transmission being brought in. So in anything that, that, that can be done around buses, around messaging, although it lies a little bit outside my direct control, for example, on issues around drop off and pick up, you know, there is a role for all of us in terms of social responsibility as well. But there will be ongoing discussions to see, are there any actions in terms of any rejigging of, of buses that, that, that can be done, which can help ease the situation? Mr. O'Dowd. That's your first question, and, and I do think that the media has to be careful and had reports and facts and rates associated with schools. They report them as in schools. I think it's more important to report them associated with schools. But my, my other point was, has there been any discussions with the uh, infrastructure department in terms of the provision of buses, particularly TransLink? But there's also many private co coach companies out there who are crying out for work. So uh, is the minister aware if there's been contact made with them? Some level of contact, and I think as part of this, uh, there is a small amount of additional money that the executive has been able to provide, both to provide additional safety on buses, but also then, as we sort of um, ease levels of, of transport, that money is not, by its nature, infinite, so it's about trying to use it as, as well as possible. But I think there has been, I think, good conversations I've had with the, between myself and the infrastructure minister, and I think there is that commitment, both at the departmental level and the more operational level, to work together to see if there's any additional elements that, that can be put in place. I suppose one of the other issues as well, which we have to respond to some extent to events, um, is that the pattern of um, drop-off of children will have adjusted a little bit as well. Some parents will have taken a view that, for example, um, the situation is that they, they will feel most confident delivering their children to and from school themselves where they wouldn't have previously. So all those factors have got to be put into, uh, into factor as well. And I had the great pleasure as well, which I think should also be strongly encouraged, um, on Friday amongst a number of schools that I visited in one of those was Jones Memorial in Enniskillen which had won the Fermanagh Sustans reward for active travel and I appreciate at times active travel is not something which uh, everyone is applicable to everyone or indeed given some of the weather conditions of Northern Ireland is something which can be done all the time but I think again the more that we can encourage both from a point of view of, of preventing spread of, of COVID um, and also creating sort of a healthy body with a healthy mind. I think the more that we can do to encourage active travel where possible, I think, is something that needs to be embraced as well. Mr. Colin Gilder, you. Um, uh, the Minister, you recently announced £5 million uh, for wellbeing initiatives in schools. Can I ask when schools will be able to start spending this money in this very important field of their work? Well, it will be put in a bit. I suppose to give a little bit of a breakdown in relation to that, £5 million equates this is effectively call it COVID, um, uh, sort of COVID recovery money. Whereas I suppose there was a total of 12 million total given on the broader, call it academic side of it, most of which went into the Engage program. Uh, the COVID money, the breakdown of that is about a quarter of a million of that five million will go to youth services. So I think a number of youth organisations have already been notified of a element of grant. The remaining 4.75 million will be divided up amongst um, schools, effectively on a pro rata basis, and. Given that this will be on mental health and wellbeing, there is a wide, I, I don't see any particular, given that the money is assured, once they've been notified of the money uh, in individual cases, uh, which they should be or should very soon be, um, I think there's no barrier in schools spending that, that money. Now, this is not an enormous sum uh, for individual schools, and there will also though, be complete flexibility on the way that schools will be able to use that money, provided it's being used for mental health and wellbeing purposes. So that might be around getting some additional uh, sort of talks or counselling sessions. 
It could be around, for instance, staff support for staff in terms of their well-being. And while naturally we concentrate on, on the children, we need to make sure that, that is covered as well. Or it may be through some additional extracurricular activities that they want to take place in, or even improving the school environment, perhaps by buying particular pieces of equipment which could be used, which would help the general. So there's a trust, I think, in schools, I think, in terms of this, to spend this money wisely and to actually determine within their own budgets and indeed their own situations. And it might be they want to put something additional into nurture um, as to what they do. They're the people on the ground in the same way as we give a level of trust to schools with the Engage programme. Mr. Gildenay. Um, thank you for that answer. And I suppose uh, it's, it's an opportune time to just acknowledge the work of teachers in terms of frontline and in terms of protecting the well-being of their staff and their school community and the children. But uh, how will this funding complement the work of the Emotional Health and Wellbeing Framework next year? Yeah. I think the idea is that, that soon there will be proposals brought through the executive. There has been um, within budget, and we bid. Um, for sort of an, an annual sum, which to be fair as well then, because of the linkages with health, there's been some money provided by health as well. So the anticipation in terms of the emotional health and wellbeing would be that it would be 6.5 million that would be mainstreamed into uh, budgets that could be provided for, mainly for schools. There would, there would be, I suppose, a series of projects. Some of this will work on the issues about uh, youth side of things and also building resilience in terms of the curriculum. Um, the idea, I think, where the differentiates between the two is, I suppose, the 6.5 million will be a range of projects, some of which will effectively be piloted because we want to see what works and what doesn't work, but will probably be a bit more centrally driven, although schools will be able to take advantage um, of that. The 5 million, difference suppose being that the 6.5 million will be mainstreamed in budgets, so what is there in 2021 will be there in 21, 22 and beyond. You know, we may reach a situation where that that amount of money expands, but nevertheless it will be there. The five million is effectively from the COVID funding, so it is effectively a one-off payment. And the level, as opposed to try to ensure that it's spent very much in year, um, the level of flexibility for schools in terms of spending that money will be will be much wider level of discretion that will be given to schools rather than on the six point five million that will probably be more directed into particular projects and processes. Mr Doug Beattie is not in his place. Mr. Jonathan Buckley. Could I ask the Minister for an update on the Children and Young People's Strategy and when it will be announced? Well, the Children and Young People's Strategy has been now created in a situation where um, it, it has now been finalised. It's obviously been a long, long while in coming and some adjustments have been made um, down, the, uh, down the years. It has now been circulated I think, to executive colleagues and I would anticipate that from that perspective, if within the next week or two, it, uh, because I think, to be fair, across the board, uh, any of the comments that I've received back from executive colleagues have been largely supportive. And I think it's not something which I think anybody should see as any level of controversy. Uh, as such, I would hope that that will be in a position that that will be signed off by the executive as a whole before Christmas. Uh, and I think it will produce a sort of longer term vision in terms of the children's and young people's strategy. Mr. Buckley. I thank the Minister for his answer. And would he agree with me, while, whilst COVID is uh, demanding a lot of prioritisation from executive colleagues and indeed the Department of Education, that it is still seriously important that departments continue to bring, uh, bring forward important priorities, existing priorities that already exist? It's, it's right. And I think, to be fair, I suspect education, as with other departments, and you know, I've seen both for myself but also from other executive colleagues where they've brought forward sort of more strategic plans for the longer longer term. So it is across the board. There's no doubt in different government departments that there has been call it a level of broadband that has been uh, with that has been taken up with COVID. And that has led at times to some things that are immediate have to be covered. And particular also in terms of the level of attention that can be given at different levels, it has meant that some people from officials, be it on issues around area planning, for example, have had on a temporary basis to be diverted into those activities. But I think for all of us, I think there are a range of, of priorities which we do need to ensure are both maintained. They might have been slightly delayed because of COVID, but I think collectively, both in the Department of Education and beyond, I think there's a determination to work through, from a programme for government point of view, a range of those priorities, some of which have already started to be brought to be fruition not just in my department, but in others as well. A single question from Mrs. Martina Anderson. 
Uh, Minister, do you understand the parents in Derry and across the north are concerned about putting their children through the transfer tests because of even COVID and that any other cobbled together test um, would be fraught with legal challenges for schools? So why not just do applications? Well, Apart from the fact that schools have a legal right in terms of academic selection to do that, the tests themselves are run separately. Look, I understand at the current situation that everybody will have concerns. I think there will be a range of health and safety measures are put in place, and we are talking about gathering together about 10,000 young people across Northern Ireland, when on a daily basis around about 300,000. Uh, you know, it will not surprise the member to know that I suspect that her and I would have a very divergent view, shall we say, on the issue of. Uh, of transfer, and while there can be around a range of, of things, people can always make legal challenges. I, I do remember that going back far enough to the point um, where one of my, my predecessors, uh, I think Katrina Ruan, who predicted whenever AQE and PPTC, which were first making tests back, uh, I assume that's probably 13, 12, 13 years ago. We were told that actually the, the test would collapse under the weight of legal challenges. We're a number of years on and they're still here. Order members, that concludes questions to the Minister for Education. If I could ask members to take their ease for a few moments and clear the chamber and don't forget to clean the spot where you were before you leave. Thank you.